In episodes one and two, we saw that moisture can get into walls as liquid water, or it can be carried along with moving air. But there's a third way it can find its way in. Quietly, molecule by molecule, slipping through the materials themselves. This invisible movement is called vapor diffusion. In modern construction, the vapor control layer was introduced to keep moisture from entering walls through this slow, invisible process. Some materials let vapor pass freely. They're called vapor open. Others hold it back almost completely and they're called vapor closed. Vapor diffusion is driven by one simple force, vapor pressure. The natural movement of water molecules in their invisible gas state from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration. In other words, air that holds more water molecules will always push moisture towards air that holds fewer until things reach balance. In winter, that usually means moisture inside of the house moves slowly outward because indoor air contains more water vapor than cold, dry outdoor air. As that vapor moves into cooler parts of the wall, it can reach dew point and condense into liquid water on cold surfaces. The idea of a dedicated vapor barrier emerged in the 1950s and 60s when building scientists in Canada and the US started to apply the physics of vapor pressure and condensation to modern wall assemblies. Engineers realized that in cold climates, water vapor moves from warm to cold and that condensation in walls could be reduced by slowing vapor diffusion from indoors to out. That's when codes began requiring vapor retarders on the warm side of walls. And to this day, the most common one in Canada is the six mil polyethylene sheet, nearly vapor proof. In the United States, the approach varied more by climate. They used vapor retarders on the interior and northern heating climates, while in the more warm, humid regions, they would use vapor control uh, on the exterior side of the wall a lot of the time. But too much vapor control can backfire. Air leaks far more moisture into a wall than vapor diffusion ever could. If that moisture condenses inside of the wall, as we saw in the episode in the air control layer, a vapor retarder can slow the drying potential to a crawl. In layered modern walls, that imbalance can be enough to cause decay and mold over time. If moisture gets into the wall through a small air leak or an imperfectly sealed flashing detail, for example, that vapor tight layer can trap it. That's why building science started to rethink its approach. After decades of trying to block vapor tightly, researchers realized that walls needed a way to breathe selectively to resist vapor when dry, but allow drying when wet. So products like smart vapor retarders were developed. A vapor barrier like the 6 mil polyethylene commonly used in Canada and some northern US regions has almost zero permeability. It blocks vapor entirely. A smart vapor retarder on the other hand, like brands like Membrane or Intello, is made from a polyamide. That's a material that changes its permeability according to humidity. So when the air is dry, it behaves almost like a barrier. Um, so in like a typical heating climate scenario, if humidity builds up inside of the wall, the smart vapor retarder becomes more permeable in reaction to that humidity inside of the wall, letting moisture move outwards towards the interior of the building, uh, towards that relatively drier air on the inside of the building where it's gonna be able to dry. Smart vapor retarders can provide a better balance than a fixed vapor barrier, but it's not a silver bullet. It still depends on careful installation and on indoor humidity staying low enough for the wall to be able to dry towards the interior of the building. That brings us to the next question. What determines whether a wall can dry and how fast it can dry? Every material has its own drying rate and its own tolerance for moisture before it starts to degrade. So like OSB and drywall, for example, start to support mold growth if they sit at about 80% relative humidity for more than a few days. That can quite easily happen inside of a wall if moisture gets in but can't get out. In modern light frame walls, there's a lot to keep track of. Every layer has its job and all of them are supposed to work together. 
your water resistive barrier and sheathing, for example, uh, on the outside of the building need to be vapor open enough to allow the wall to dry outward. You have to avoid double vapor barriers like using an interior poly and then an, on the outside a foil face foam type of insulation because that is going to trap moisture in the middle. Both are really vapor impermeable. And even if you use smart membranes like the ones that open and close with humidity, they only reduce the risk. They don't eliminate it. There's a delicate balance between air tightness, insulation, and drying potential. Even small detailing errors can shift the balance and turn a high performance wall into one that really struggles to stay dry. In contrast to modern framed walls, which depend on a careful balance of membranes and sealants, but often don't achieve it in practice, a rammed earth wall doesn't need a separate vapor control layer at all. It's already vapor moderating by nature. Moisture moves in and out of the surface gradually. It can absorb a significant amount of moisture during humid periods, but because there are no hidden layers or cavities, it isn't trapped. It simply dries out again over time. Even when stabilized with a small amount of cement or siloxane, like in the stabilized rammed earth, um, the rammed earth still buffers humidity naturally. That's what we mean when we say these walls breathe. They're vapor open, but air tight. They allow gentle moisture exchange without the risks that come from sealed and layered cavities. So in this episode and the last two, we saw how water, air, and vapor each influence how moisture moves through a wall or can move through a wall. Uh, but temperature is what really ties them all together. It determines whether and where condensation will form or if it will form. In the next episode, we will look at the thermal control layer. We'll look at how temperature interacts with the other layers, why keeping surfaces warm prevents condensation, and how rammed earth approaches this challenge in a completely different way. So if you're enjoying the series, if you're learning something new, I would love to hear your thoughts. Leave a comment below. It helps me to figure out what we wanna cover next as well. Um, I've got so many ideas, but your comments are really helping me um, come up with ideas as well. And if you haven't already, hit subscribe so you don't miss the next episode on the thermal control layer and how this ties into the bigger picture of healthy and resilient design. See you next time.